Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm very, very excited to be speaking with you all today. And it's super nice to see familiar faces with, uh, from other OSP events. Um, hopefully, you're enjoying London and you enjoy the, the amazing pizza. <laughs> and I know it's a bit of a tough hour, so I will try to wake you up a little bit. And uh, I hope I succeed. So let's get started. So today I want to talk about DSOM, which is the DevSecOps maturity model, the OSP DevSecOps maturity model. I will talk a little bit about maturity models, and then we will get into the actual practical details of DSOM. But before we dive in, um, I know that some people might say, like, hey, this is not a representation of my company. But quite frankly, this is just me bringing forward a lot of the learnings that we've had at JIT when, when we implemented DSOM in our dev organization, and I just want to bring forward those learning from our experience, and I'm very excited to share it with you all today. So before we actually dive in, I think that we need to do a quick introduction. So Sam <laughs> did most of the introduction, but I will uh, do a little bit more. So my name is Raz Probsten. I'm a solution engineer at JIT. I've actually started as a full stack engineer, and I've been a full stack engineer for many years. Um, I joined JIT about a year ago, and after eight months of this position, I've decided to shift things up, and uh, I became a solution engineer. I'm studying for my bachelor's in biotechnology, and I'm a big foodie, so that's a bit about me. And I will tell you about JIT as well. Uh, JIT is an open DevSecOps orchestration platform. We're helping modern dev organizations own their application security without hurting their dev velocity. We're automating a lot of open source security tools, and that's a bit about us as well. <laughs> so let's talk about DSOM from theory to enforcement. So we, we are going to dive uh, in a little bit uh, to maturity models in general, because I think it's important for us to kind of set the baseline here of uh, what a maturity model is. Then we will get into what DSOM actually is, again, the DevSecOps maturity model. And we'll get to, to what, in my opinion, is the most interesting part of the talk, which is operationalizing DSOM. Um, you know, a lot of these maturity models could be great in theory, but then we're left with the question, how do we implement it? And, of course, we're going to talk about how to automate everything using open source tools. So, what images come to mind when speaking of security maturity models? Don't worry. I won't put anybody on the spot here, uh, but I think we can all agree that it does not sound like the most interesting thing in the world. But hold on. When implemented correctly, maturity models could bring a lot of value and a significant value to our organization. It could really help you make a difference in your organization, whether you're a CISO, a team lead, a developer. It doesn't matter. This could help you make an impact. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about those reasons and the values just to cover that as well. So the first value is translation to leadership. It's very common for technical personas to have a hard time speaking and explaining to non-technical leadership persona. Because, you know, nerd to nerd, we're fine. We understand each other. We speak the same language. But we need to be able to explain things to non-technical leadership personas. Maturity models could really help you do that, right? Because you're using metrics, you're using numbers, which are those maturity levels that we're going to talk about uh, soon. And we can really come forward and say, like, hey, we're at this level, let's say level one, and we want to get to level two and three, and this is what we need to do, and this is the benefit of doing this. It's basically just finding a shared language. Current state analysis. We spend a lot of time and money bringing in consultants and doing internal analysis. And using maturity model, models, you can do it. You can do the analysis, and you can see where you are from a security perspective, all in the same swoop. Gap prioritization. This is not rocket science, right? <laughs> you just need to identify your gaps and give them priorities. Current state analysis and gap prioritization really help put everything into context, which, again, is really helpful for the translation to leadership. Tools and automation. We have to automate. If a process is not automated, it's not going to last. It's, it's going to die. And maturity models can show us, like, current state, we're doing OK. But this is a manual process, and this is what it's going to take to automate it. Resources needs. 
this is really important. Like, we're doing this right now at this level, but we want to be here. Now, these are the skill sets that we need, and these are the resources that we need to get there. This, again, all helps with the translation to leadership. And last, but definitely not least, uh, it's probably the most important one, this is risk exposure. We need to understand where the risks are, and we need to understand the level of those risks. So, hopefully this is making more sense now, and uh, you kind of got with me on the theme, like maturity models are not that bad. <laughs> it could actually bring us a lot of value. Now let's talk about the leading maturity models out there. Uh, the first one is NIST. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. NIST is quick to say like we're not a maturity model, but it sure looks like one and acts like one in terms of the different levels that we see. They have some great publications out there. Feel free to check it out and see if you can utilize them in order to see where you are from a security perspective. Next, we have CMI. Now, this is really levels, right? We see level one through five, but we do need to put some effort here in translating this because you see initial. What does initial mean to me and how can I connect this to how my organization is doing and operating? Now, it's good on the levels, but it's tough on the translation for CMI. Next, we have SCA, Cloud Security Alliance. This is a bit similar. Um, we do love the fact that they've translated those steps, the level one through five, to fit the specific areas of cloud security. But still, it's a bit more broad than what we want, and it doesn't really get into the, the DevOps and the DevSecOps perspective. And the last one is OWASP SAM. Now, shout out to OWASP SAM. We do love it. And uh, DSAM actually borrows a lot from, uh, from OWASP, OWASP SAM, but it's a bit too rigid for us. It's not as flexible and it's not as agile as we wish to have. All right. So, why do we like DSAM at JIT? Um, we utilize DSAM and integrated it into our development organization. Um, we have some intakes based on the work that we've done here, and the reasons that we've uh, ended up with are, um, first of all, it's open source, right? We love open source tools. We think they're the future. We know they're the future. I think most of us can agree on this. This is pretty, pretty much why we're here. Um, but we like DSOM because it was actually built by the community, and it's different than something that was built for, uh, to sell, for example. It's developer-owned. It's called the DevSecOps maturity model. We look at ourselves as a high-performing or elite team in terms of, of uh, velocity, and DSOM is really all about developers. Automation and tooling. There is integration from DSOM into different open source tools, which is very helpful for us. It helps us identify the areas that we need and we want to automate, and we can see it more clearly across our life cycle. And the last one, stakeholders' value. This one brings value to our developer, it brings value to our team leads, and it brings value to our leadership. Again, the translation to leadership, this is super important for us. A bit about DSOM. Uh, DSOM was built by a very nice guy called Timo Pegel. You can see him here. Uh, it was built in 2017. It's really focused on security and DevOps strategies. It's based on the need for security prioritization for developers. Timo built DSOM with a simple realization of, I don't have any way to rate how my organization is doing from a DevSecOps perspective. The project is posted on the OS page. You can scan this QR, it would take you straight there and uh, it, it will show you the link to the GitHub repo as well. Um, this is a view of DSOM. You see that it's kind of a, a bullseye shape. Now, this shape along with the, the circular pattern, this is how DSOM measures maturity. And you can see right away the difference from the waterfall CMI that we've seen in the beginning. And all of the layers here are specific to software development. Each of those layers are built by dimensions and sub-dimensions. The dimensions are uh, build and deployment, we have culture and organization, implementation, information gathering, and test and verification. Um, one thing I wanna say, and we're not gonna talk about it today, but DSOM actually provides mapping to ISO controls, so it really helps with compliance. So this is another benefit as well to use DSOM. 
This is a better view of DSUM. Don't feel the pressure to read anything. <laughs> um, you can see here that we have the dimension build and deployment, and we have subdimensions build and deployment. And within each of the subdimensions, we have the four maturity levels. So it's really important to just artificially choose four levels because in some cases, Timo actually collapses in those levels. So you can reach level three and also reach level four. In some cases, you have level one and level two combined. So in some cases, you really have to comply to uh, only three levels. But you do have the maximum of four. I know that recently they've uh, created the, the fifth level, but it's actually just the, four level that, the fourth level that just uh, split. So don't worry, it's four. <laughs> All right, so I hope you are alive because <laughs> this was kind of an overview and I hope this is making more sense now in terms of why we like it and how is it different from the other maturity models out there. So for this talk, we're gonna talk about implementation and test and verification dimensions. We're not gonna go over each of their sub-dimensions as well, because we don't have enough time for this today. Um, but I do have to say, like, culture and organization and information gathering, they're still super important. But this is what we thought was the first cut. Like, this is the first step that we need to take in order to improve, improve our maturity across the, across the board. Um, again, don't feel the pressure to read anything. We're gonna start with the first one, with the first dimension. Um, we're gonna go a bit slower now, and then, uh, just to get you guys started, and then we're gonna go faster for the, the next ones. So, the first one is implementation dimension uh, and application hardening sub-dimension. So we have the three levels here. The first level is consider security explicitly during the software requirements process. The second one is increase granularity of security requirements derived from business logic and known risks. The third one is mandate security requirements process for all software projects and third-party dependencies. I know this is a lot of buzzwords and it's hard to understand and we will break this down a bit. So don't feel any pressure that you don't understand and if you don't understand. So the way that it's broken down here is that we see that we have those two work stream. We have the software requirements and we have the supplier security. This is not, this is not surprising that supplier security is uh, separated due to all of the supply chain attacks that we see. All right, so we see this, but how do we operationalize it, right? From theory to enforcement. The way that we looked at it is that we have to keep things simple. There is a lot to cover in DSOM. It could be very complicated. We saw all of the buzzwords there. So we just said, okay, let's build a flow and we'll work by this flow for every dimension and sub-dimension that we're gonna go over. So the flow that we chose is that, first of all, we need to understand the risk. Then we need to map the security requirements, which are, what are the action items that we need to take. Then we need to understand what tools we wanna automate and then we need to test it. So looking at maturity level one from a software perspective, um, high level application security objectives are mapped to functional requirements. The objectives are is that we wanna prevent stealing of any code and data from our application. So the action items that we need to take here is that we wanna scan our code for vulnerabilities and we wanna scan our code for hard coded secrets. From a supplier perspective, evaluate the supplier based on organization security requirements. And how do we do it? All software libraries are updated with vulnerability remediated. The action item here is that we need to scan our codependencies for vulnerabilities. Okay, now we have our three action items and we need to find the best open source tools for the mission. Now, this is really the fun part for us. Again, we love open source, it's truly a community power, and all of the tools could be utilized in order to help you reach those goals and enable DSOM within your organization. I am going to share just the tools that we chose at a general, the open source tools that we're automating, just to kind of cover that. So we're using Trivi, Bandit, Cubescape, SamGrep, uh, GoSec, we're using Prowler, Zap, Nancy, Kix, and OSV, 
and we're constantly adding more and more. Now, if we're going back to the application hardening subdimension, we have the three action items, and we need to implement the matching tools that we chose. So for code scanning for uh, vulnerabilities, uh, we're using GoSec for Go. We're using SEMgrep for Python, Java, JavaScript, uh, TypeScript, Kotlin, Scala, C Sharp. And for dependency scanning, we're using OSV scanner for uh, Python and PHP. We're using Nancy for Go. And we're using NPM audit for JavaScript, TypeScript, Node.js, basically everything that is JavaScript based. And the last action item here is uh, hard-coded secret detection, and we're using Gitlix, which has support for multiple languages. So we covered the first maturity level. We're moving on to, to level two. Again, we see the two areas here. So, so from a software perspective, we need to have structured security requirements that are available and utilized by developer teams. We achieve that just by using those tools that I've showed you before. We integrated them into our development process. So we're there, we have maturity level one and two just by using those tools. From a supplier perspective, build security into supplier agreements in order to ensure compliance with organizational requirements. Now, we're not quite there yet. Uh, I, it gets into a bit more manual process, supplier agreements. I know that there are tools out there. I'd love to hear your feedback if you have any recommendations. But for us, this is just a bit of a back and forth with our suppliers just to get them to comply with our third party security pieces. For maturity level three, from a software perspective, build a requirements framework for product teams to utilize. Again, by utilizing those open source tools, this gives us our framework, but we do have to understand what are the tools that make sense for us, but we feel like we're there, we have maturity level three. From a supplier perspective, ensure proper security coverage for external suppliers by providing clear objectives, Again, a bit of a manual process for us and a back and forth with our suppliers. All right, so that completes the first subdimension for us for today. And we saw how we kind of climbed up those levels, those maturity levels for us. And hopefully this is making more sense of how to better utilize and use everything uh, with open source tools. So, up next is development and source control subdimension. We're still under implementation dimension. For level one, source control protection and versioning, the action item for this one, SCM implementation through GitHub, level two and three are collapsed here, so it's pre-commit checks and validations. Uh, the action items for this one is that we need to enable the code scans from the application hardening subdimension and we need to enable or enforce branch protection. And for maturity level four, this is shifting left all the way, right? We're talking about IDE extensions and we're talking about local linters. So how do we do it? For maturity level one, we simply want to use GitHub. I realize it's not as easy for everyone as it was for us, but we're a startup, we're all in AWS and we're using all of our repos in GitHub. Um, I know that other companies might have legacy or on-prem, but for us, it was a straightforward way to achieve this requirement. For levels two and three, we just talked about all of the code scanning tools that we're utilizing. We also enabled branch protection, so we've got those, boom, we're there as well. For maturity level four, we're there as well. We've developed a VS Code extension that run the code scanning tools locally on the, I, on the developer's IDE. Our extension is not open source, but it's free and it's open to use. Um, there are other great security IDE extensions, so you can just choose what's right for you. There is one more subdimension uh, that I'm not gonna talk about today, but it, it's worth mentioning. Uh, infrastructure hardening, you see it's is strong, um, but I do want to share with you uh, some of the open source tools that we utilize in order to get all the levels here as well. 
So for con container scanning and Kubernetes scanning, we're using Trivi and Kubescape. For cloud security and infrastructure as code, we're using Prowler for AWS, D GCP, and Azure. And we're using Kix for Pulumi, CloudFormation, AWS CDK, uh, Terraform, and Serverless. Great. So now let's talk about another dimension, tests and verification. And we're going to start with application tests subdimension. Again, for this one, we're not going to go all, over all of the subdimensions. Uh, so I'm just putting it out there. So we see that uh, maturity level one and two are combined. So we jump straight to level two. Level two is security units test for important components. Um, the action items that we need to take here is that we need to have code scans on all the repos, which we're doing. And we need to have infrastructure scans across production. We also talked about the open source tools that we're using for infrastructure scanning. Maturity level three, this is security integration tests for important components. This is basically, basically pen testing and web application scans. Now, for this one, we used Cobalt. Cobalt is not an open source tool, but it's a pen testing community. And we use them basically for compliance. But there are other great equivalents out there, like Zap. Zap is one of the most powerful pen testing tools out there. So you can just find something that works for you. Level four. This is high coverage of security related module and integration tests, smoke tests. So we basically need to have stability and functionality testing that is integrated into the development processes. We did this by using Selenium scripts for our smoke tests. So this was a kind of a short subdimension. And the next subdimension is consolidation. Now, I really like this one because it feels like it's kind of bringing everything together. So if we're looking at the levels, for level one, we have definition of quality gates, simple fa false positive treatment, treatment of defects with severity higher, higher. The action items for this one is that we need to implement and enforce code, infrastructure, pipeline, and third-party scans for each PR. We need to implement branch protection and require approval before merging a PR. We need to have a process to review false positives. And we need to triage all of the high and critical vulnerabilities. So again, by using the open source tools and by checking all of the boxes here, we can make sure that we have level one fully covered. For level two, this is simp simple visualization of defects. For this one, we basically want to have a dashboards and reports for vulnerabilities backlog, and we want to have vulnerabilities per PR. Maturity level three, this is integration of vulnerability issues into the development process. We need to have treatments of defects with moderate severity, and we need to have usage of vulnerability management system. This again, shifting left, right? We see the integration of vulnerabilities into the development lifecycle. The action items for this level is that we need to triage all of the moderate and highs. We need to track, manage, and report on vulnerabilities. And one of the most important things is the developer perspective. We need to integrate those scans into the PR process. And if we find any vulnerability, we need to comment on the PR, right? So just like a developer gets a code review from his peer, he needs to get a security review. If we find anything, just leave a comment. This basically means that we need to utilize disciplines like GitOps, and we need to enforce those policies. But this is a talk by itself. Now, for maturity level four, this is advanced visualization. So we basically need to have tickets, and we need to handle all of the defects. The action items for this one is that we need to have detailed vulnerabilities with RCA. We need to handle all the levels of the vulnerabilities. And this makes uh, level four achieved and all of this subdimension um, completed. Awesome. So there are a lot more subdimensions. And you can achieve all of them just by using the open source tools that we've talked about. I just really wanted to give you a taste of DSOM because I know it can be hard and kind of overwhelming just starting to think about maturity models. Like, where do we start? But I believe that 
utilizing open source tool, it, this is a great way to start. You can easily see how you can achieve this different level for DSOM just by using the tools. Now, if we want to kind of sum up here, then I want to circle back to the values and the benefits that I mentioned at the beginning. Because looking, looking at all of the maturity levels across the dimension, we can see how everything is coming back to those values. We talked about the tools that we want to automate and use. Those tools are here to show us all of the vulnerabilities that we have. This connects to risk exposure because we know where the risks are and we know the levels of them. The dashboards and reporting can help us with the current state analysis. This can help us understand our gaps. This all leads to resources needs because we know what we need to do in order to climb up those maturity levels. And when we know that, we can explain what we need in order to climb up. So again, this helps us with the translation to leadership. All of those metrics help us create the simple language to translation to leadership so we can actually be able to explain. Now, this brings us kind of to the end of everything, to the end of the talk. And I hope this was helpful to really understand the different levels and how we're thinking about it at JIT. Now, this is my shameless plug here. I hope that no one would kill me. But I just wanted to share JIT as an example of how we implemented the stuff, how we implemented DSOM in our dev organization. Because the way things are working for many companies, this is a, basically a manual process, right? You have Excel sheets with all the, the vulnerabilities. This is hard to handle. And we talked about the importance of automating. This is not going to last, and this is not scalable. We're automating everything in our platform. We have an automated backlog. We're automating the process of utilizing all of those open source tools. This is a huge amount of tools. Um, and we're doing this uh, in order to enable DSOM. Now, if this is interesting to you and you want to know more, I encourage you to just check out our website. Uh, we're free to teams up to 10 developers. Please feel free just to scan this QR or visit us at JIT.io. Feel free to reach out to me. This is my email. You can reach out via LinkedIn as well. And I really do appreciate the opportunity to talk with you guys today. I'll happily answer any questions you may have during the break and we have the pub. Um, so thank you, everybody.